Hi, Mom. Good morning, Lizzie. Welcome to another exciting episode of today's yoga question. So I wanted to ask you, I'm teaching a workshop on Sunday called Love and Death. It's a restorative yoga workshop, and Sunday is All Saints Day here in Germany. And I just wanted to know your take, kind of get your thinking about what the Yoga Sutra offers us um, about these paramount themes in human life, and especially death. What does the Yoga Sutra offer us about death? I'd like to start my answer by a disclaimer that I am very much an amateur student of the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, uh, a very devoted and somewhat moderately uh, talented or less than that student of the Yoga Sutra, but I will offer you my opinion uh, about what it is. The Yoga Sutra does not talk about love in the way that we understand love. It, it talks about attachment, and in fact, much of what we call love, I think, is attachment. So we have in English the phrase unconditional love, which I find redundant. In my opinion, love is by nature unconditional. Because if it were conditional, it wouldn't be love. Hmm. So in the Yoga Sutra, on the other theme, in the, in the Yoga Sutra on in Pada 2 or Chapter 2, verse 9, Patanjali talks about Abhinavesha. Now, Abhinavesha is the fifth of the kleshas, which are in the immediately preceding verses. And the kleshas are the obstacles that are our uh, roadblocks to integration, to, to the end of suffering, to wholeness, to presence. And the first one I want to speak of a little bit before we hone in on Abhinavesha, which is the which is a clinging to life. Um, the first klesha is avidya. And a means not, and vid means seeing with the inner eye. And ya means actively doing it. So this implies that we are actively, not just, it's not an accident. It doesn't just happen out of nowhere. We are choosing it on some level. We are cultivating on some level actively not seeing the true nature of reality. We have put on blinders. And, and that, that is the ground for all the other ones, including Abhinavesha. So we can understand some of the other clashes more easily, the clinging, the pushing away. Uh, but we, we don't understand this, this very well, I believe, this clinging to life, uh, this, this fear of death. And some translations call it the will to live because it seems like the most natural thing. So I think that when I, I'm, I think we need to look at it in context of the time and culture from which the sutra sprang. But it's also true that the thing we deny the most is actually the most everyday event, the most expected outcome of every human life. Hmm. Every human life is so different in its process, but every human life ends in death. And it is the thing we deny the most. So perhaps a way to think about a Abhinavesha is not the clinging or the will to live because that's a, that, that in my opinion, wanting to live and live richly and fully and completely with love in my heart and love guiding my actions. The wanting to live is, is not the problem so much. That seems like a nat, the natural human state. The challenge comes in avoiding our fear of death avoiding 
the talking about it, the thinking about it, the preparing for it, the willingness to accept it. We, we, we often act surprised when someone dies. And it's actually the least surprising thing. So there's a part of us, I believe, that carries a certain low-level anxiety with us all the time about this unknown, this unknown thing that is coming step by step. And there's a, a metaphor from a movie that I liked. It was called Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Hmm. It starred Paul Newman and Robert Redford, and it was a Western, it was a comedy, and they're bank robbers, and they're sort of lovable, sometimes in ep bank robbers. For example, they run away from the American West and they go to South America because they're being chased and it's getting harder and harder to rob banks. And so they have their routine and they go into a bank and they realize they don't speak Spanish and no one can understand. <laughs> what they're so they're being near the end. They're being chased by the sheriff and he's wearing a white hat. And they do all the tricks of evasion that have helped them so many times. And then they think, that did it, that did it. And then they look, and here he comes again. And they keep saying, who is that guy? So they finally get to what appears to be the end of the road. And there's a huge drop off into a river. And here comes death. Here comes the certainty of death. They can't escape it with all their tricks. We have all our tricks you know, collect a lot of money, collect a lot of jewels, collect a lot of yoga asana, become powerful in the world, whatever. But here comes death, regardless of their finagling, their squirming, their denying. So they're standing on the edge of this precipice, and, and they know they have to jump or be caught. And so Robert Redford, you know, says, I, I can't swim. And Paul Newman turns to him and said, are you crazy? The fall will probably kill you. And they jump. This is, you know, they jump into the void. And the next scene, they are seen in a house of ill repute, having the time of their lives. So they clearly made it. But the metaphor I like is that that sheriff in his white hat and his posse are dead. They are, death is hunting us down and we can do whatever we want, but we will eventually not escape it. And so to me, a Benevatia is the deep understanding of the inevitability of it and, and the noticing of the anxiety we have for around our own death and the death of others. It is a low level anxiety, low level anxiety always with us, to notice that, to invite that anxiety into our conscious mind and to understand that, not to watch it, to be present with it, to give it love, that fear, that fear that drives us to do all those, so many things that we do. It's, it's, you could almost say that love and the, and the, and the fear of death are the two things Thanos and Eros that that are driving our lives, and we like the love part, but we don't like the death part. So, being a yogi of deep practice to me means that you're willing, bit by bit, not in an obsessed way, but in the opposite, in a in a, an accepting way, to allow those that awareness to come into our consciousness. I like to say that I don't like to hang out with anybody who won't talk about death. That's why I like hanging out with Buddhists who are heavily into impermanence, death, decay, and suffering. <laughs> uh, and I say that with a smile on my face. So I think they are very related. It's a, it's a deepest form of acceptance, which is very different than giving in. I like that. I like that very much. I have heard before Shavasana, corpse pose, described 
as a dress rehearsal for death, that we lie down at the end of an asana practice to practice letting go, which is ultimately what we will all do in death. Do you see it that way? Yes, of course. Um, it is It is the conscious choice of accepting my mortality. It is the conscious choice of being with a difficult awareness. And the irony is that I have found, and wiser people than, than, than I have found, no doubt, that it is in fact the willingness to accept this truth that makes our life so sweet. It sweetens our life. It enriches our mm -hmm. life because we then are willing to live more fully in this moment. And we take no, no moment is, is wasted because the only wasted moments are the moments I'm not living fully. That every encounter with each person, that every day, that every moment is a gift. And to, to be willing to live that gift, even though it's sometimes difficult. And I think that's what Shavasana teaches us. And I think in the West, maybe we, we, we turn away from Shavasana a little bit now in our yoga practice because we're convinced that somehow if we can do handstand scorpion in the center of the room, that death won't find us. There is no strategy of escape and we can't, we don't want that to be true. So maybe if I don't lie down and let go and give up my seeming control, I'll be okay. If I just get everything right, just everything right in my life, it's all checked off the list, then I will be happy and never die. In conclusion, there's one more idea I'd like to share about this question of love and death, is that actually we experience a lot of death every day. Every day ends. Every moment ends. There are many transitional moments in our life. Our birthdays are a celebration of our life and, a, and a, a could be an awareness of one step closer to death. We, we, we celebrate transitions like graduations and anniversaries. And I think in those moments, we can learn to hold the joy of the trans transition and the sadness of the loss and that those are both those both the the sweet and the bitter make up the whole of a, of the taste we have of life and that it enriches us when we're willing to notice transitions when your child become become your baby becomes a toddler your toddler becomes a child your child becomes a, a teenager your teenager becomes a young adult. Your young adult becomes a full-fledged adult and has children. There are wonderful, joyous moments and a tinge of sadness at the loss. Where are my babies? They are no longer there. They exist in a different form. So cultivating the willingness to feel the sadness of the loss, I think, is also part of understanding our fear, our fear of the ultimate loss. Hmm. Thank you, Mama. Thank you, Lizzie. I wanted to just tell our listeners about two ways they can engage. If you liked listening to this conversation, we have a digital course that is really the same dynamic. My mom answering questions brought on by her book, the second edition of Living Your Yoga, Finding the Spiritual in Everyday Life. And you can download that audio course at judithhansenlasseter.com. And I'm also very excited to tell you about a charity donation project that we're doing called Shavasana for Refugees, where we are offering a guided shavasana from mom 
in exchange for a donation to the refugees in Europe. So more information on that is also available at judithhansenlasseter.com. Thank you so much for listening. Namaste, Mama. Namaste. May we live like the lotus at home in the muddy water.